mess of time and space Where you have no say Or the date and place Don't get embarrassed if it happens a lot You don't know how you started Or where you're gonna stop And if at times it seems insane All the tears are searching Turning all your joy to pain If I suit up learning By a dream and hide away Can't escape the sorrow The mojo will have no effect As we head into tomorrow I had a great childhood in what Stanley Road where I lived, in Woking. The actual house was like a funny little old Victorian, two up, two down, tiny little place. And a fantastic family, you know, my dad especially, were very, very close. And we'd always spend loads and loads of time together. And he'd always be taking us out over the woods. Every Sunday morning they'd go over to the woods. So I used to clean the house and get the dinner on. So they used to go over there and they'd play cowboys and Indians. And, and I'd be up a tree with a, with a, a bit of stick going like that. And people would go by and go, but, you know, and some little woman would knock, knock her over and say, you're going to scare her. Well, Nicky's his sister and she's four years younger than him. And you could let them out and you could go off and you didn't have to worry about people or things take, happening to them. So they had a lot of more freedom. Financially, yeah, there was something missing. But then love compensates for that. But I suppose later life you'd see what hardships your parents went through. My mum, she was only very young when she had me, she was only like 18, so she was always listening to music and buying records. So there was always music in the house. And he sort of got a love of rock and roll, because that's all I used to play lots of the times. And then I used to play the Kinks and stuff like that, so he liked all them. And then the Beatles came along and he loved the Beatles. My first recollection of seeing the Beatles on TV was probably their Royal Command performance at the height of Beatlemania as well. I was just hooked from there onwards. I think I was probably about 12, 13 maybe when my father bought my first electric guitar. I did a bit of posing in front of the mirror with it and then it gathered dust in the corner for a few months. And then I got more serious about it and actually decided to try and learn to play it. I remember that when we got it, he was very, very pleased about it all. And it didn't seem that long that he had it before he started to sort of t take control of it all. And where we got the wisdom for that, I don't really know. I hated school and I hated authority and I hated being told what to do. And the music for me was a way of escaping all that. I was probably 13, 14, I met a fellow called Steve Brooks. We used to get together and thrash around on these old guitars that we had and, you know, new chord, be a new song, you know. And it was, um, it was just a natural progression. We had this book called The Beat Was Complete, which was like all their songs, all their music in one big book. And we would just sort of go through that and plunder the book and just copy all the chords, you know, and just sort of try and vaguely change the tunes a little bit. Me and Steve did our first gig at a place called Woking Working Was Club, which was just around the corner from Stanley Road. My dad managed to sort of hustle a little spot for us on a Wednesday night. Paul uh, met up with Rick Butler, and we started playing with him, and then we went out as a three-piece for quite a while while we were looking for another fourth member. John used to go out a couple of times a week and he'd go around and get more gigs in some pubs, clubs, all around white workingmen's clubs. It wouldn't matter where it was as long as we got a gig. And then gradually it all kind of builds up and word gets around. I used to encourage him and his little band and say, yeah, that was great. Kind of gives young guys a boost. You're looking for somebody to back you up somewhere along the line. And what better than your old man? That's it. I don't think you could ask any more from a manager, really. I think you're lucky to find someone like that to manage a band. Someone's got 100% belief in who they're looking after. Because at times when we would get down and think we weren't getting anywhere, he would sort of rebel rouse us and say, listen, you know, we can do it in another year's time, we might have a contract. When I joined the, the jam in 74, there was Steve Brooks on rhythm and lead guitar, Paul <coughs> on uh, bass, and, um, and Rick on drums. So then, obviously, I joined as second rhythm guitarist. From 75, one of the first major bands to make the impression on you was Dr. Feelgood. I thought they were just amazing. Yeah. 
probably one of the first gigs I ever saw. And Milko Johnson, who was the guitarist at the time, was just fantastic. And they had this kind of thing with like suits and kind of 60s. And I was forever going on to the others that we need to have some sort of direction, something that will set us apart. And so we all trooped off to Burton's and got these black suits made up, which become our sort of uniform for the next three or four years. And I bought a scooter around that time as well, and that was it for me, really. It was just sort of turned me head, that whole mod thing. I got into a lot of soul and R&B, a lot of Motown and stuff like that. The whole mod thing was just something that rang a bell with him, you know, and it didn't ring a bell with me. Um, so that was probably where we started to part, part our ways. I was getting more and more into the faces, the kinks, and Dirty Who as well. He didn't like the direction I was steering the band in. It was a little bit of a power struggle because it had always been our band up to that point, and I guess I was sort of taking over a bit more. So there's possibly some ego battles going on as well. He just wanted out at that time, which brought us back down to a free piece. I wanted to keep it more along the, the, the sort of Beatles sort of stuff that we were doing. Um, and we could have still been doing working with clubs now if he'd have stayed with me. So. <laughs> when Steve left, we had to rejig the lineup, and uh, <clears throat> Paul wasn't at that time. He didn't seem that happy playing bass and singing, taking lead vocals, and so he just sort of shoved the bass to me. So it was kind of forced upon me, and I just said, "Well, just show us a few bass lines," which he did, and just worked on it. Around late 75, early 76. When we started playing the pubs in London, we started playing to more like our contemporaries, really. The gigs were getting better, and that kind of opened up another world for us, really. We realised there was this a whole different scene out there, you know. And they were just fun as well, you know. We were just lolling about in the back of the transit, drunk, coming home down the A3. We felt we were getting somewhere, and the record contract was just around the corner, and we were kind of gaining a following and getting a good reputation. They were my favourite times, I suppose. It definitely changed my world seeing the Pistols. I thought it was amazing. But just the attitude as well, you know, you hadn't seen a band with that sort of attitude. I hadn't anyway. And I wanted to be part of all that. I was 17 at the time, and I was, that was kind of like, well, this, this is it. My generation's wake-up call, I thought. Seeing the Pistols and also the Clash as well, we were writing about unemployment, writing about society, teenagers being bored, you know, I mean, it was just things you could relate to, really. It made me want to try and write about contemporary issues. Early 77, we got signed up to Polydor. It was quite a lot of money for us. We got signed up for six grand at the time, but it was still a pittance compared to what most other bands were getting signed for. And then we made our first single in the city, which came out in April 77. I think it got to like top 40, which was great for us. And then getting on top of the pops and all that stuff. You know, I mean, the things I sort of only just dreamt about, really. Making their debut on this week's Top of the Pops, here's the jam and an effervescent U45 called In the City. To make a record was such a big deal. To see this finished thing in your hand, you know, and then to be on national TV was like, wow. So it all happened fairly quickly after that. There was this momentum going on, you know. We were getting more and more people coming to the gigs. We made two albums in the first year, 77 as well, which wasn't such a great idea looking back on it. The first album was quite well received in the city. And then we made another one towards the end of the year, which was patchy to say the least. It bombed and it got bad reviews and it almost looked like we had it really. And I was losing interest as well with the whole thing. I know maybe I had two songs. It wasn't really coming out of any ideas at all. Because there was a lot of pressure as well, I suppose. I didn't really realise what it entailed. 
But then when someone says, you know, well, you've got to write another album, it's like, well, fucking hell, I haven't really thought about doing that, do you know what I mean? It's taken me two years to get this one together. There was a lot of pressure, you know, to, to come up with the third album, which could have put us back on the right track or, or completely bury us. But then we started to do some demos, probably in the January of 78, which again were fucking dreadful. So that gave me a bit of a kick up the ass, really. And with that, I went away and started again, and I got back into writing again. And that was the roots of all my cons, which really blew up big for us. That was when we started to really take off, I think, and our following got much stronger and bigger. We were playing bigger places, and the album got the top ten and went to number six. Ladies and gentlemen, wham, bam, thank you, the jam. <laughs> Expectations were coming true. That's all they were at the time. And then all suddenly they're happening, you know. And then a lot of the stuff is taken off, lifts from your body out of, onto somebody else's. And which is great because you feel that you've done your bit. And I think it broke a lot of barriers for us with that album. It made a lot of people realise there was more to us than just three little geezers from Woken in black suits. There was things like English Rose and Fly. So there was these love songs as well, quite gentle songs. So it was a real mixture, and I think it was musically very advanced for us. And I think probably for our generation of groups, it was quite advanced as well. And we didn't look back after that. My writing, after all my cons, just got stronger, I feel because I took it more seriously. And I start to see that it's like a proper art form, you have to work at it. And I thought the Eaton Rifles was a great subject matter to write about, really. There was a Right to Works march that started in Liverpool, and we were marching down to the Hours of Parliament, and they went via Eton, where some of the young chaps from Eton were sort of shouting that from behind the railings. And uh, I just thought what a great sort of scene that was, you know, kind of you know, the unemployed marching past this great seat of learning and being jeered at by all these wankers. pressure on me being called a spokesman for a generation. I mean, it's a weird thing, you know, because probably four years prior to that, I probably would have loved that. My little hazy dream of what I should be or what I could be in life. But when it actually happened, I just thought it was quite a heavy weight to have on my shoulders, really. And just some of the questions and interviews were just like, you know, I don't know, mate, you know, I ain't got a fucking clue. You know, I'm still trying to find out myself. I was just writing what I saw around me. And I think they were the sort of things that people related to. All the time we were just blossoming, really, as a band. Singles were selling 250,000, you know. I mean, it's funny now to think, you know, you can get to number one with 30,000 record sales. I mean, I don't think you'd have got the top 100 in those days with those sort of sales. That sort of time, that's probably the closest we ever came to what it, in a, in a small dose, obviously, what it must have been like for the Beatles or something. And building this huge and loyal following as well, you know. It was fantastic at gigs. It was electric, purely electric. 
As soon as we struck the first chords, everyone went bonkers. There's also that thing I sort of forget sometimes how young our audience was. There was like kids of sort of 12, 13 into the jam, you know, it's like a playground thing as well. Around 1980, I remember being influenced by bands like Wire and Joy Division to some extent. I liked the kind of angular thing they were doing with pop music. Confusion in her eyes that says it all. She's lost control. And she's clinging to the nearest passerby. She's lost control. There was still a melody there, but it was kind of almost sort of deconstructed a little bit. So those sort of bands were a definite influence on sound effects. I thought it was the first sort of album where we retained elements of our sound, but we made it sound a lot more contemporary, I think. Start brought us into a different area of music, really. That's why I thought it should be the first single. I thought it should be like, here it is, is the new sound. And I felt that tune did that. And it was a big hit as well. I mean, it was like another number one. That's entertainment. It was massive at that time. I come back from the pub drunk and I just wrote it all in one go really. Wrote all the lyrics anyway and then got the tune for it the next day. You could sense in, in the jam camp that things weren't 100%. They weren't as much fun as they used to be. But I can only guess they're pretty obvious reasons. You know, I mean, we were riding high in the charts. We were selling out venues up and down the country. We were sort of at our peak, I suppose, which is all fantastic, but it comes with a lot of pressure. I was getting to lots of different styles of music around that time as well. And I was just more and more falling in love with that old soul R&B sound, really. And like I always do, whenever I get into any sort of style of music, I just, that's what I want to play at the time, you know. The jam were getting bigger and bigger. We did Top of the Pops with uh, Town Called Malice and Precious, which went straight to number one. It was like the first band since Slade to do such a thing, and the beat was before then. That's it from Top of the Pops. Good night, we'll see you next week. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 7. And as it's the second time Seattle have come straight in at number one, here's a bonus for you. Town Called Malice. I wanted to leave the band up eventually because I just wanted to move on. I wanted to go and do different styles of music and try different things. I wanted to break out of just being the free piece. It was too constrictive. And I was only 23, 24. I think all of it got to me a bit. We were either on the road or making a record or I was trying to write a record. The band were taking him for granted. Too much so. I won't mention any names, but one or two of the members of the band were taking him for granted. It wasn't like, oh, well, I'll just go, you know, to my place in Barbados and wait for the phone to ring when Paul's come up with 12 hits and we'll go in the studio and put them down. It was nothing to do with, you know, just letting him get on with it and we'll just stroll in. Far from it. 
selfish or not, I mean, that's what I had to do, you know. I wanted to go and see what else I could do in life, really. I think I was also kind of a bit daunting to think, well, we could probably carry on doing this with the jam for the next sort of ten years. And with that in mind, I just knew instinctively it was time for me to move on. But it was a very hard decision, and more than that, it was harder to tell everyone. The first person I told me was my dad. I said, you were fucking joking, didn't you? That's what I said. <laughs> Which is understandable as well from a manager's point of view. You've got something successful as we were, and the person wants to stop it. He said, well, I want to play music, but I want to play it differently, and I want to play my stuff my way. And I don't want anybody in the background who doesn't like it. And that's basically, that's the truth of the matter. But then to have to tell Rick and Bruce, that was hard as well. They didn't take it well at all, and Bruce especially. I thought the band had years left in us of, of you know, good songs and a lot to offer still. Um, so, yeah, obviously very, very, very upset in time and difficult to, to deal with. The lifestyle I'd sort of visualised, which was beginning to be visualised, beginning to be realised and hopefully is going to happen, was just beginning to start and then all of a sudden to have somebody say, well, I jam out a window, and then I thought, gosh, you know, where goes, where goes my plan? They became the most successful pop group since the Beatles. Their records went into the charts at number one, and last year they were voted the best group and best songwriters. But now the Jam have announced they're breaking up. The band is amazingly successful. Why stop now? Because I feel we've achieved enough, you know. I think we've done all we can do as the three of us. I think it's a good time to finish it. I don't, I don't want to drag it on and, and go on for like, you know, for the next 20 years doing it and become nothing, mean nothing, end up like all the rest of the groups, you know. I want this to count for something. What could it count for? It strikes me that after people get uh, over the age of like 25, once they get their, their house and their wife and their kids, you know, ideals don't mean nothing, you know what I mean? It was a bad day. It really was a bad day. I mean, I got home to Woking and I had so many scooters and so many people outside the house crying and saying, you've got to help get, change his mind. I said, well, not much I can do, you know. It was just emptiness, a real feeling of emptiness that that really is it then, isn't it? That is it, you know, and I was just, yes, yeah, shocked, in shock, I suppose, afterwards, when you finally realise that is it, that is the end of the jam. It was like the first day of spring to me. It was like having a fresh canvas and starting again. I got even more heavily into the mod thing and started to retrace a lot of the roots, seeing the kind of European influence in it, whether it's Italian fashion or style and the French sort of influence as well in it, and got into jazz as well. I had the idea to have more of a floating lineup, so there'd be a nucleus of a band, there'd be me and Mick Talbot, which eventually also became DC Lee on vocals and Steve White on drums. And we named it the Style Council. So it wasn't like it was guaranteed success, but I quite liked that as well. That was exciting to me. Our first single, which was Speak Like a Child, came out in 83. which for me crystallised all that sense of the new and youth and vigour. I mean, I suppose one of the greatest things for me is that when I, when I look at the future now, I just think there's so many things, so many more things we can do, which just, and I just think it's endless possibilities. Do you know what sort of possibilities? Do you have any distinct idea? Or do you take it as it comes? No, it's, it comes. it's a bit like a musical Kama Sutra, you know? <laughs> I like that, don't you? <laughs> I'm glad you stayed your position and made it clear. Paul was quite a funny fella, and um, I don't know that some people want him to be funny. I mean, if they've got a perception of him, and I guess it's 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 all down to how you first, wh where you first make your breakthrough when the public first becomes aware of you. So there are some people that just want that sort of 
sweaty, shouting, ranting sort of 18-year-old to never go away and that different people get annoyed if Paul doesn't play a guitar on a track sometimes. It's like, why did he put that guitar down? Play all that poncy stuff. It is hard to kind of reinvent yourself, but I think that if you're into music, then you kind of explore all avenues. And I think, I think with, this, with the Style Council, Paul was using technology, a little bit more drum machines and stuff. And, you know, it's a natural progression, I think. He does have a sense of humour, and I think that, that that sort of period was him doing quality music, but also having a bit of a laugh. I just kicked against everything that people thought I was, which involved rubbing people up the wrong way a lot of times as well. I got fed up being just boxed into this one, you know, wellers like this. There was such a sort of leap from what people were used to. I guess it took a lot of people back, really. is a lovely bunch of people he really is um i think uh, ever changing moods lyrically does sum paul up uh, he can turn on like as the wind blows there's a lot going on in that head definitely the rest of us brought paul uh into not reality because that's, that's not the word paul thinks and felt everything and everyone he was very intense we brought lightness to him, I'm sure we did. We reminded him that he's actually very funny and very light too. The readers of New Musical Express said that you were the most wonderful human being. What's your own opinion on that? Yeah, I go along with it, you know. I think uh, they've got quite a good taste. <laughs> I like that one. The first album, Cafe Blue, was a mixture of everything, really. I think I only sang on like maybe two or three songs on the album. We had a guest vocalist in, we had someone rapping on one track. We had two or three instrumentals. At the end of the day, you, you still had what, you, what I wanted. I had full singing all the time, writing the songs, complete control, so to speak, of all the things that go into making a band. That was pretty beginning to look good now. And it, that's, that's how it worked out. Well, their fans were obsessive. So it was like, when you went to a gig, it was like, you know, their army. And, you know, it couldn't be a bad gig because people were just willing it to be great. I love, you know, obviously you're the best thing. <laughs> but yeah, he's got a beautiful voice as well. I thought the first three years of the Style Cats were amazing. And I also thought we made some great music as well. And I think from 83 to 85, we made some great records, you know, that stand the test of time. plays a tremendous number of benefits. You give of your talents extremely um, generously. You've played benefits for CND, for animal rights, for the miners, as we say. Why do you do so many? Is it almost trying to give something back? Well, I just think um, music's obviously like a popular culture, and I think it's got a place within society, you know, within politics as well. I mean, it's, they're, all, they're all relative. And, uh, and I don't think, I don't see really how you can detach, detach you know, any of those, those subjects at all. And to me, they're all kind of in, interwoven and I think you can do some useful things with music I mean, apart from making people feel good through the power of music and the spirit of it I think you can also um, you can maybe make people see a different side to things 
he always had a bag with him, always had a notepad, constantly writing things. But when we did our favourite shot, a lot of those sort of tunes really sort of reflected how things were in the 80s. If you wanted the soundtrack of the politics and, and where society was at that time, then I think it's all contained in that record. Trade unions were being run down, unemployment. I grew up in the 30s with an unemployed father. He didn't riot. He got on his bike and looked for work, and he kept looking till he found it. Seeing those pitched battles with the miners and the police. For liberty there is a cost. His broken skull and leather cosh. From the boys in uniform. Now you know whose side they're on. We just come out of the Falklands War in 82. We had Thatcherism. Smack was massive everywhere. I mean, it was kind of a society in decline. I and mean, I thought we reflected that. It's quite a complex world once you start getting into politics. In the, you know, everyone's got an opinion. And it was a time to be, to stand up and be counted. But it was a, it was a tricky time as well. Once you start sort of uh, entering the realms of sort of uh, politicians, then you're expected to have an answer to everything. A nationwide tour by leading groups and leading singers under the banner title Red Wedge in the cause of the Labour Party. It's the first time that a lineup of pop musicians have linked themselves openly with a major political party. Our biggest mistake was to get hooked up in the Red Wedge. That was our downfall, if anything. We were doing loads of benefits before that Red Wedge thing happened and not being partisan at all. We were outside of party politics. We had no respect or time for any of them. And I wish we'd have kind of sort of stuck to that video really, as opposed to getting involved. Bill, comrades and friends, can I first of all disabuse anyone of the idea that Red Wedge is the name of my hairstyle? <laughs> my experience of doing Red Wedge was a great camaraderie amongst the musicians. People were doing it for the right reasons. But then meeting the politicians reinforced what I always believed. And they're just out for themselves, really. And I'm sure there's exceptions to a rule. But I can only say the people that I met, that's definitely the vibe I got off from anyway. So that was kind of it for me. But I felt we were used. I guess we shouldn't have gone into it thinking anything different, really. Well, from my perspective, what was going on with the band was that three, three four years in, we'd put out a single every three months for two, nearly three years. We'd um, put out an album with four instrumentals on and guest vocalist and Paul only singing on two or three. Then the following year, we had a number one. And at the end of that kind of three years, I just think that the encapsulation of what the Style Council was all about was, was probably a, a begun to run its course. We all lost interest, really. We'd been at it for three years, we were pretty full on. Done a lot of gigs, a lot of records. You just start to grow up and other things in life take their place. Mick and his girlfriend were going to have a baby and I fell in love with DC Lee. Basically, we were dating now, we'd been dating for a little while. Um, by the head, everybody knew. Um, we'd kept it quiet for a little while because the whole thing was if it didn't work out between us, I didn't want to be known as the singer who Paul Weller was knocking off, you know. <laughs> so it was more to do with me than him, because from the, the minute we got together, he wanted to tell everybody. But I kind of didn't want to make that mistake of, especially with somebody that high profile, if it goes wrong, it's going to look really very bad. So I think it was my mum, actually, who forced him into it. She said, do you love my, my daughter? I'll do anything for her, do. Next thing you know, we're married. Yeah, so <laughs> we did get married, and, and it really was the best thing that happened to both of us. I just wanted to go and enjoy being in love. We go off to Europe together. It was just a nice time, you know. He kept saying, we're too happy. We're just too happy. And it, it really was too perfect. But for me, I had no problem with the fact that we were too happy because it's what I'd always dreamed of. I've never met a man who spent more time in the bathroom than me, but it was quite comical sometimes. I never ever bought him clothes, because it was just a complete nightmare. I'd buy, oh, honey, what do you think of this shirt? It's lovely, babe. I know you don't like it. No, it's lovely, babe. I know you don't like it. Well, tell me the truth. OK, it's the collars. <laughs> I 
our last couple of records hadn't sold that well and got bad reviews. And I think probably our relationship with Polydor wasn't so hot then. The last two albums we made may be seen as slightly less consistent. I think they've got a lot about them. It's just that um, I don't know if they clicked with the uh, public in general at the time. Paul was discovering house music. He became very interested in the whole concept of ele electric, you know, electronic percussion, which was quite groundbreaking. For Paul's audience, they hadn't heard anything like that, and we did it quite authentically. We got with the producers that make that kind of music. I was just really taken with that whole sound. Once I get into something, it's like 100% for me, and naturally, again, I just wanted to make that sort of music. Our last ever live Style Council gig was at the Royal Albert Hall in 1989. The whole set was just all this new stuff, which A, they hadn't heard before, and B, was house music. So I think it was a bit of a shock to everyone, really, because there was people ripping up their programmes in the seats of the Albert Hall and just totally dumbfounded by it. That's definitely one of the ones that have sort of been erased. Yeah, it wasn't very good. <laughs> we were booed and abused. We made a whole album of that stuff, which we then submitted to Polydor who didn't like it and thought it would spell the end of us, really. The kind of rug was pulled out from under our feet because we expected to put an album out, and uh, Polydor decided to say that he didn't want to release it. It might have been the sort of final nail in the coffin, you know? We got dropped by Polydor and the Style Council split up. I think we were in our sort of dying stages anyway. I think we knew that. I think once you've been dropped by a major, it's, people just, like, you're, you're sort of dead in the eyes of... Uh, the industry in a way. From being so confident and always having it your own way, I suppose, if you like, to losing what seemed like he was losing everything, and quite frankly, he couldn't get past that. He really was very miserable. Really, really, really lost. Really lost. Really down. All confidence gone. And it was really quite horrible seeing him like that. And I didn't really know how to cope with somebody who'd gone into such a sort of deep depression. After all that success and selling all those records and playing to all those people, it didn't count for anything, really. It's almost like, regardless of that, you've still got to start again. He lived and breathed music. So when he lost all of that, he just lost the plot, basically. It was getting a bit finickety and there was all these little snipes going on in the press about how he's not got it anymore and he's losing it and blah, blah, blah. Well, he's been doing what he's been doing for a very long time and I was, my attitude was, do you know what? Chill. Let's go hang. Let's, let's go make our little family. Let's do our thing. And that's what we did. And then around the same time, me and Dee had Nat, who's our first son. So it all happened at the same time. You know, I was kind of redundant work-wise. And yet this new life was unfolding as well. And I was kind of like a house husband, not through choice, but that's the way it sort of worked out at the time. But musically, yeah, there was something missing. I think he was really, really enjoying it. And, and obviously his first child came along and, and then not too long, he had a second child. And I just think he'd like needed a break. Well, I think he was just beginning to try to build up a, 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 a new way of going on in, in the music business. And he wasn't too sure what was going to happen. You know, confidence is what it's all about. And I don't think he was that confident. I almost didn't know how to write a song anymore. Picking up a guitar was like kind of alien to me at that time. It was almost like I don't even know how to play this thing properly anymore. My dad was the one sort of cajoling me into getting back out on the road. But it's a very odd time. We did a couple of tours and we were playing to like very, very few people. I got the call from Paul. Do you want to go and do some gigs? You know, we're up for doing gigs. And I remember we gigged Newport and we did um, all these godforsaken places. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with Newport. But we played kind of everywhere. I remember, and it was in Wales, um, the crowd sort of chanting, it's like a fucking Morgan here. It's like a fucking Morgan here. That was kind of like, fucking hell, you know, I've done all this work and I'm still sort of back to basics. So I've got to go back to clubs and playing to a few hundred people after all, playing to thousands. The tears come fast to do a sanitized cup of malice. 
For the audiences that went to those early gigs, they could see that it was me still trying to find my feet as well. Bless them, but they kind of stuck with it. And then for about 18 months later, you could see it was getting together. And people were getting excited again, you know, because we were, I suppose, because the closer we were to finding ourselves again. I realised I hadn't been back home, as in Woking, for years and years, long, long time. And I drove around all my old haunts, and our old house as well, and Stanley Roads. All the beautiful places I used to play as a child as well, which really mean a lot to me. It's almost like a side of myself I've forgotten about. I've been so wrapped up in all these other concepts and bollocks and nonsense. So it was good to rediscover that, and that was definitely good for the music as well. For remembering all the things I liked about music and all the influences I had as a youth. And I think it's always good to remind yourself of those things because they're the soul of a person. I did find direction again. Which wasn't easy at first because there wasn't very much to write about. And then it started to come. The songs just started flying out of me. The windows of a train The reflections of a paper cup Can get small in a pale blue sky Point. Um, we were doing really well. I think studio-wise, things were coming together. The first album was recorded pretty much with me and Paul and Jacko uh, coming in. There's lots of brass on it. I think it was a really good record, quite a soulful record. The first album, I bought it on the day it came out, you know. And even the cover doesn't look like a man that's all washed up, does it? I mean, you look the bollocks on the cover. There was this new tune, it was called Into Tomorrow. Incredible. It was up and he was playing the guitar and it was fucking having it and it was brilliant. That was the turning point for him, you know, picking up the guitar again. The whole album was great, I thought. Um, but then the one after that was just fucking... I bent my head. still finish off the first solo album and I had about 10 songs for the next album. I'd started writing Wildwood by that time. Creatively for me it was, it was a great time because songs were, were flowing. He was writing, just writing all the time, writing, writing. And then he discovered the manor and that I think is, he would probably say is his favourite place in the world to go and make music. The manor was really a very special place, it had a real magical qualities about it. You know, you could feel it was in the wood and in the stone and the floor and everything, you could just feel it. It was a really magical time. By the beginning of the following week, we had about eight masters done. And I think we were all kind of looking round, going, it shouldn't really be this easy. Wildwood was my attempt at trying to write a modern day folk song in a very traditional way. Musically, it was just one chord sequence that goes round. 
and the dynamic is built from the voice. You have these concepts for songs sometimes and they don't always work out. But when it comes off, you've been able to obtain what you're after in the first place. I think that's quite a rare thing, really. Wildwood was the album that was like... Uh, let's not call it a comeback, right, you know. But it was like, fucking hell, man. These tunes are mega. Suddenly, I was flavour of the month again. The records were so successful, you know, I was back on top. And it was funny to come in out of the cold after all that time. And then all of a sudden, I was on the front cover of the enemy again, when everyone loved me. I was a mixture of amusement and I suppose a bit of relief as well that people still liked me. Around that time, and we went and did Glastonbury. And I think that once again, Paul's reputation as a live player was really, really hit. Because I can remember that we were playing just as the sun was going down, which is always the best time to play at the festival. 100,000 people there, and you, you could tell that they were with us. That's when the live thing really started to go into to orbit. I certainly couldn't have predicted how it all went, how it all blew up as big as it did in the early 90s. After the council split up, I mean, I had no idea of what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was ever going to go back into music. I, I had no fucking idea whatsoever. I, I thought maybe it was all over. He had never, ever before paid any attention to people saying he was fantastic and you are great and da, da, da. He'd just taken it in his stride, never had a problem, and he nearly lost it and got it back. I think Paul decided this was his time now to act the rock star. And that just meant going out drinking more, maybe before when he wouldn't flirt with women, maybe he's doing that, I don't know. He kind of just lost the plot a little bit and it kind of threw him, threw him off, you know. He kind of got on a wild horse and got thrown off very badly. They split up pretty much the night that we did Glastonbury. He just told me that they'd split and he wasn't sure where he was going to be staying and uh, all those horrible things that happened. In, and, and I was like, blimey, this is as good as it's been for ages. And But like, you, you know, maybe there is that element of, of, of needing chaos of, of, around you. Some, some people are like that. I was running around an awful lot. I was having a fucking good time as well and loving it. The downside was that I'd ruined my relationship and my marriage. And I, that's inexcusable, really. I know now to this day that some people spend their whole life looking for what I had at that time with Paul. And if I never get it again, I actually did have it. Some people are still looking for it, so that's exactly what we had. It was fantastic. I met him in 94. I just walked straight up to him and put my hand out and went, all right, mate. And uh, he might have given me his number, actually. That's fucking so bizarre. You know, what, getting up the next day, is that Paul Wells phone? It can't be. That's ridiculous. And uh, I gave him a ring, I went over to his house. And <laughs> within about ten minutes, we were writing a set list for an imaginary supergroup. It was the first generation of musicians I felt I had anything in common with, even though I was ten years older than them. There was no one in the 80s I ever related to. And meeting Noel and people like that, Graham and Damon from Burma, I mean, they were people with a similar musical vision, I would say. I certainly couldn't remember feeling like that before. The jam generation just came through, you know. We were jam fans. You know, that, that's my big things with the jam and the Smiths, you know what I mean? And the jam made way for the Smiths, who then split up and they made way for the Stone Roses, who then split up and they made way for us, you know. So, just our little... You know, our little mod revivalist generation come through, man, and check for the man.
the whole Britpop thing kind of happened. And the, the term the mod father, Paul being cited by the likes of Blur, like the likes of Oasis, saying, like, you know, well, it's cool, well, it's great. I guess songwriting came back to the kind of focus and, and it, was, it was about the songs again. And there was a kind of a resurgence of, of pride in, in things that were English. And I think that that resurgence was a very obvious link to cite Paul Weller as, as an icon for a lot of those groups. Well, Stanley Ray was me at the peak of my writing abilities, at least up to that point anyway. It wasn't a concept album, but it had some sort of themes running through it. There's a lot of things about growing up and about woking, I suppose. For me, it's a record that kind of encapsulates a particular time, not just look at, about looking back, but about looking at where he was, thinking, as you do at that particular time in your life, of, well, where did I come from and what influence has it had on me and where, what does it mean to me and what does it mean into where I'm going. You reinvented yourself for the third time, like a... Uh, I don't reinvent myself. You never reinvent yourself? No. I just change, you know, people evolve and change. I wasn't necessarily referring to the, the three periods in your life. Can you describe the jam period in one sentence? Yeah, it was, they're kind of like my teenage years, you know. And the style counts was like me in my 20s, and this now is me in my 30s. So to me, it's just, you know, me just evolving over time. So that's why I don't... I can't think of it as being reinvent, you know, me and reinventing myself, really. It's kind of a natural process to me. All the songs in there for me, the whole vibe of the album, you know, works as a whole body of music, I feel, as well. After the critical acclaim of Wildwood, and all of a sudden this, this album comes, comes out and just starts selling and just starts selling some more and just sells some more, right across the board, two million records sold. So, obviously, the gigs were selling out, and when he really gets into that kind of out there zone and the music's just happening, that is, it's a force of nature. I'd clawed me way back up, my little star was in its ascendancy. There was this kind of surge of popularity. You could feel this thing sort of growing and building. I suppose a similar sort of feeling as when the jam started to take off, you know, you just kind of, you feel this surge from underneath you. It was an exciting time, you know, and I suppose exciting to sort of feel it second time round. After 95, I think that um, in the public's, um, with the success of Stanley Road, I think it kind of um, established uh, everything about his, uh, his career. That's become almost to a point where Paul is now, that I think live is where he loves being. I mean, you've only got to look at something like the Hyde Park thing in 2002, and um, what a, a, you know, an amazing night. We walked on stage and we just, we just hit it. I do feel married to music. I mean, it's not something you can put down, I don't think. You know, it puts you down, tells you when you've got to stop. He's always doing something. If he's not gigging, he's in the studio. If he's not in the studio, he's mixing a fucking live album. If he's not mixing a live album, he's here doing demos. If he's not doing that, he's always doing something. Well, every album's different, you know. Sometimes they're a struggle. 
it's part of the fun and it's part of the appeal that you just don't know what it's going to be like, you know, until you start writing or until you start actually producing the music. But I would always endeavour to try and sound different to the last record anyway and try and move somewhere else with it. I felt As Is Now was as good as I've ever done. If I don't ever make any more records, ever, then I'd be quite happy that that's my epitaph. The songs are great, even from the first single, From the Floorboards Up, I thought it was amazing. I got to feel from the floorboards up Call it to call it if you like that touch Call it what you will, I really don't care too much When you look back on what Paul's achieved musically, it's just the, the, the prolific nature of 67 singles. You're going to look back and think, Paul is definitely up there with some of the greatest musicians, greatest tunesmiths, greatest poets that this country has ever produced. Now that you have been talking to me, and forget all this and that and, and all the sound, forget all that, if we were just talking on our own, I would say the same. And I'm saying to you now that I'm very, very proud of Paul. Of course I am. And he's been a, you know, a real pride of mine. Like he said to me not so long ago, he said, I'm quite happy the way things are now. He said, you know, he said, I'm big enough. I've got people listening to my music at home, not only in the gigs. I've got people paying to see me, he said, you know, and cheering me and, and clapping me. And even when the gig's finished, they still want more. He said, so it's got to be good. He said, if I went on the stage and there was silence all the way through, even the last song, and I didn't want any more, then I'll be pissed off, I'll, you know. But he said, it doesn't, that's not happening. And what's happening? He said, it's everything I thought it would, hopefully it would, and it does. And now he said, I'm afraid, I've got to say that I expect it. <laughs> Which is fair enough, isn't it? Look at my older children's attitudes and I think they're really healthy. I think they're very fine people. If they're a reflection on their generation. I think the world's in a good place, you know? We need more of that, don't we? I've just had another Charlie, well, he's 15 months now. You know, for all the things that frighten me about getting older, the other side of it is that you give less of a fuck what people think and I think that's a very, very healthy thing. Because I do have my moves and my tantrums and all the rest of it. As an artist, I think you've got a kind of excuse because you can say you're just being artistic, but sometimes it's just a pain in the ass, really. Don't they? I think I'm still trapped in my own little world. My feet are on the ground, but my head's in the clouds, you know? And I still have my little dreams. I can't really grow up from that. I don't want to either. I can't imagine my life without music. It's my religion, you know, it really is. It's my faith, and I think that, you know, it comes and goes, but I think if you're interested and you still love it, I think it'll always come back to you. Sky's so wide.